Hello everybody, my name is Liz Darlison. I'm a nurse consultant at the University Hospital of Leicester and I'm also um, head of services at Mesothelioma UK and um, you'll be aware that we've been doing a series of interviews with people um, to um, share with the UK mesothelioma community and today I am absolutely delighted to introduce you to Victoria Bennett um, and um, Victoria's had a relationship with Mesothelium UK for a number of years, actually. And um, Victoria um, has uh, written a book of poems that will be launched later this week. And um, the inspiration for that book of poetry came from Victoria's experience of looking after her mum, who sadly died of mesothelioma five years ago. Uh, Victoria's mum was called Maureen and we're going to hear a bit more about Maureen further on in the interview. Um, so Victoria, um, welcome and thank you. I, I understand you have um, an MA in creative writing and you've been a freelance uh, writer and artist for some 20 years and um, you've won quite a few awards as well and now that I've heard some of your poetry and you know had the pleasure of seeing some of your work I'm not surprised at all um, so um, I have got a list of questions that we're going to work through so first of all Victoria do you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself and um, what would you like to share with people um, well hello anyway thank you for, for having me along Liz um, I, I live in Cumbria in a very rural part of Cumbria uh, with my husband and my my son um, He's 12, so he keeps me busy. Um, and I write full time um, alongside being a full time carer for my son who has medical needs as well. And so it's full on. Um, I'm also a carer for my father who's, who's elderly. Uh, so there's a lot of care in, a lot of care duties in, in my life. Um, but I enjoy living here. It's a wonderful, sort of quiet place to live. I also write for video games, which is a bit of a different oh. thing altogether. <laughs> I, I, not, not your usual video games. I write for games that engage children in learning um, and heritage and environment and things. So, so that's a little unusual thing with a, another little hat on. <laughs> and um, your mum, Maureen, was the inspiration for this collection of poems. Um, would you like to tell us a bit about your mum, um, and 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 then we'll ask I'll ask you a bit about her mesothelioma experience. But tell us a bit about your mum first. Okay, um, here you go. This is Maureen. I don't know whether the reflection's too bad, but this is my mum. No, that's lovely. We can um, see that. I describe her as as a lady who wore a wide brimmed hat. I'll tell you a little story from when she was a young woman. Um, when she was very young and um, first with my father and they cycled round Europe just after the war yeah. um, together on cranky old bikes you know, none of these fancy bikes and she made herself a wide brimmed hat that, and a hat box that she put on the front of her bike and took it all the way around Europe so that she could wear it walking down the Champs-Elysees <laughs> Which I think is, I don't know why, but that seems like a good description of who my mum was. Um, yeah. She, she, there's, she had six children. Um, there are five of us still alive uh, and several grandchildren and great grandchildren. So family was really important to her. Um, but she was an artist all her life. Very unconventional. Um, we never really fitted in. <laughs> But she was she was very creative and but very family oriented as well. And we traveled a lot. Um, so she she traveled all around the world and lived in lots of places um, before they were fashionable to live in and before traveling was something that was done. So I think uh, and she loved to garden. <laughs> and, and what kind of art was your mom um, involved with? Uh, well, she started off as a, when she was first, she went to art college as a young woman and she actually started off as a, a fashion illustrator for Vogue um, in London, which she gave up to have children. <laughs> she also said she didn't really like the people in it, so she said it wasn't too bad to give up. Um, 
so, but she continued to be to do like freelance fashion illustration and articles and columns in papers and then later on in life she she did mixed media watercolor she particularly liked going to the windiest wettest places of uh, of the scottish coast and painting them <laughs> um but she painted right the way up to the end of her life as, and as much as she could and after that she said she just had retrospectives where she put her paintings up in her room and and let all that she said she had so many nurses coming in and out that she could have a retrospective exhibition <laughs> she um sounds quite an inspiration your mom she she was and she still is yeah um and you said am i i mean do people say that you're like her yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, mean, just... I, I think people say that i'm like her more because they can see a, a physical likeness because the rest of my family are blonde and ginger like my dad and my mum and i both had dark hair it's not quite so dark anymore <laughs> And obviously that artistic flair um, is there with you. I think you. I followed, yeah, I mean, I followed a creative one. My dad, my dad wanted to be a poet, but um, I think in that day and age, deciding that as a man when you had lots of children was probably not acceptable, so he, he had a more responsible job. <laughs> and so your mum was diagnosed with mesothelioma um, in December 2014, is that right? It, yeah, on Christmas Eve, is twenty fourteen. Twenty fourteen. Do you want to tell us a little bit about um, now? Um, um, unfortunately, I know that you didn't have the best experience leading up to your mum's diagnosis. So, um, so, but you know, it, it it is what it is, and I'm sorry that that was your experience. But do you want to tell us a little bit about that and um, uh, what yeah, you went I through mean, the family? I think. Um, to sort of to, to position it my mum was the oldest of three children and she had already lost her sister and her brother to mesothelioma um, and she'd originally gone to doctors with a with a slight persistent cough back in 2012 and the doctor had said that it, and, and she'd asked if it could be mesothelioma um, because of her sister and her brother. And the doctor at the time said, no, that was so unlikely that it was too rare and, and she just must have a chest infection. But it was a chest infection that didn't clear up um, <laughs> if it was, any, you know, so she, she stayed with this persistent cough um, for two years, really. And started to get more and more tired um, so the jobs that she would normally be able to do, my mum was a bit of a powerhouse, you know, she would power through, you know, a whole garden and obviously having six children, she was used to being busy all the time. And, yeah, high and she energy. started to notice, <laughs> she started to notice that things that would she would ordinarily be able to do were tiring her out. Um, but people told her, well, you're, you know, you're 82. This was at this point, you're 82, you know, what do you expect? But my mum was fitter than most people of 50. Um, she never smoked, she never drank, she never did anything that was, you know, and she was always very fit and active. Um, so eventually this cough just sort of continued to get worse and the breathlessness and the tiredness. Um, and I was actually having investigations for, for um, a chest issue. And the GP wanted to just check my mum over um, before doing a genetics test for something else that they were testing me for. And they spotted, this was a different GP, and they spotted something that didn't sound right. And that led to an X-ray, which led to a CT scan, which led to a, a PET scan, I think is the word. And at that time, she was, this was in March 2014, she was told that it was probably mesothelioma. So early on, she was told that it probably was. She had a lot of fluid. Um, and she went and she had the fluid drained and pleurodesis done and, and the biopsy done. Um, at which point she was told it wasn't because the biopsy came back clear. Um, and she was told that it was probably pleurisy and told to enjoy herself. And my mum was very relieved at that, but knew that it wasn't mm. really true. Um, and I kind of pushed a little bit, but my mum wanted to let it go. She said, you know, we'll let that go for a bit and we'll see how I go but she didn't she got worse and so we had she went through a lot of tests um 
a lot of consultants, I think five different hospitals, 12 consultants. Um, she was misdiagnosed with other cancers, um, and lymphoma at one point, and, um, and eventually she was diagnosed um, on Christmas Eve. So we went home on Christmas Eve. They said, yes, you know, it is, it is malignant mesothelioma. Um, and she was just told to go home and they would instigate some palliative chemotherapy. And, and that was kind of, that was it really. After what had been yeah nine months of, yeah. of i know i mean uh, nine months of a lot of investigation and a lot of having to fight for for them to, to take her seriously really despite <laughs> having you know so, siblings who'd also died from um, it. yeah so the warning signs were there i guess you know having two siblings and just before we go on and just talk about her treatment and then her um, her experience after diagnosis I just um, you know as I said I'm really sorry that that was your experience um, it's not what we hope for anybody at all um, unfortunately we know that it happens you know mesothelioma is not the easiest cancer to diagnose um, and the index of suspicion for mesothelioma um, varies across the country and in women we know that you know that that index of suspicion is often lower um, and I also just wanted to just um, just for, for people listening just to talk a little bit about that genetic link so we know that um, we know that there is um, it's been identified that there is a genetic predisposition to mesothelioma it's very very rare and um, you know I'm someone who's worked with this disease for 20 years now and I can still probably count on one or two hands the people that I've met over the years that I think that maybe they have that genetic predisposition it's been a relatively new finding and not one that we fully understand it's not independent of asbestos exposure um, however we as a charity have put together an information booklet about the BAP1 mutation that is the genetic predisposition and I think talking to you has motivated me to want to interview um, an expert in, in the genetic predisposition. So I, I will make a promise here that we will sort that out. Um, and of course, just want to reassure people that if anybody is concerned and wants to discuss um, in relation to their own um, experience or own family situation, just pick up the phone to Meso UK because you know, I'm, I'm, I'm one of, well, there's nearly 30 nurses now. I, I, I think there's 27, 28 nurses. We're all um, expert in mesothelioma. We'll be very glad to talk about that, that in your particular family's context. So, um, uh, so I just wanted to mention that. I hope you don't mind. So, so we get the picture of Maureen, very inspirational, very artistic, uh, mother earth by the sounds of it, um, with six children and, and then had this lost two siblings long lead up to diagnosis and was offered to go home and palliative rate chemotherapy. Um, and that was Christmas Eve, uh, 2014. So what happened after that? What was the journey like after that? What treatment did she have? And um, initially my mum asked, uh, she asked if there could be any surgery. She, you know, she said, well, can you just sort of you know, take it out? <laughs> um and, and she kind of looked she asked a few questions about trials and things that she was kind of met with you're too old which which um which it was hard because obviously she was very fit and you know i mean even right up until quite late on you know her whatever the the index is that they use for for ability to cope with stuff was was still sort of a, a level of, of somebody who was about 30 years younger than her um so she was just offered the palliative chemotherapy, which she didn't really want. Um, I think at that point, because she had seen her sister and her brother die, she was kind of like, I, I know what, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to get out of this really, I think was her attitude. Um, so I think she decided rather than, rather than get too, trying to fight for that treatment you know this was just her this was her decision not the decision yeah. that everybody makes obviously she decided that she would try and just make the most of the time that she had and i think she understood 
in herself that she'd probably had it for quite a while um, and that this was her last bit really. Um, so we had good GP support at that point. We had, you know, they, 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 they helped us a lot with the, what we call the polypharmacy. There's a poem in the book actually called polypharmacy. Oh, um, you, get, <laughs> you get very used to all the long names and the mixing of things. I used to wonder what the postman thought of me when he'd go past and I'd be in the window at six in the morning, grinding things into yogurt and stuff to get my mum to take them. Um, but uh, so we had a lot of sort of polypharmaceutical care. Um, we had, like I said, she had a, she had two sessions of chemotherapy, but then she developed um, sepsis, sepsis. Yes. Um, and it was just very traumatic. There was no space at the hospital, and she ended up having to be treated in a in a um, the, the family room. And it was just she just said, "That's it. I don't want I don't want to go through any of that." So we went away to a little cottage by the sea in Cumbria, and. And she told my dad, which was really hard because I think he wanted her to keep fighting. And she said, no, you know, that's it now. Um, and we got a, we got a second opinion at that point as well. And she transferred her care to another hospital, um, to somebody who was maybe more specialised in it. And that was, that was really positive. Uh, I think for the first time she felt like she was being heard and supported. And, and she had some radiotherapy done to relieve um, some of the pain. She had a lot of steroids, which made her very, very, um, very large, which was difficult for her. But we also had a lot of support from Miso, well, sorry, Mesothelioma UK, sorry, get used to calling it yeah. Miso UK. Miso UK is um, fine. I'm glad you mentioned that. So I know that you uh, contacted Miso UK at the time and yeah. had various yeah. discussions, and uh, I think I was involved in some of those discussions. Yeah, um, I mean, right, right from the start, actually, you know, I found out about the charity and then made full use of that helpline <laughs> and all the information online. And I think that that gave that gave me the power to advocate for my mum. Now, my mum was of, of a generation where doctors are right. Yes, you know, you don't argue with the doctor. I'm not of that generation, and also because my son has medical needs, I'm used to being in a medical situation and challenging sometimes and saying you know no are you sure about that you know let's look at this so I think I was probably their least favorite family member because I'd go in with great swathes of paper <laughs> and use the right language which I think is actually important you know if anything if anything really really helped in, in terms of dealing with the medical orders was having that language from mesothelia in the UK to be able to talk in a way that they understood and yeah. that they could just say well you know you don't understand because I've but, but but I do understand. <laughs> um and it also helped with me being a carer because it was very lonely. Yeah. And very hard at yeah. times. Um and we you know I had support from the local hospice at home charity and we had a great Macmillan nurse which was wonderfully challenging for my mum because the Macmillan nurse turned up and he was a ban. <laughs> and my mum said, Oh, I wasn't <laughs> expecting that at all. <laughs> But he was he was wonderful. Um, so we had we had good support. Um, and how long how long was the period of time between mum finishing the chemo um, and uh, you were involved heavily in her care at home? Um, so what was that period of time like? How did you make the best of every day? And um... my my mum's chemotherapy started in January. She finished it in March. Um, and she died in December, the 1st of December of the year. So from that point on, she said, I don't have a big bucket list. I've, I've seen the world, I've done all the things I want to do. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm not in any great, you know, I don't have these great dreams and things. I just like to spend time in my garden and with my family. So that's what we tried to do. Um, I mean, I, I moved in with with my mum and dad into their house uh, when it became I went there every day because I lived close by but when it became apparent that that my mum wasn't safe to be there I should explain that my dad is very elderly and is, uh, has had a stroke and, and w my mum was his carer so she, he couldn't look after her um, he's also profoundly deaf and, and, and partially sighted so 
when it became apparent that my mum needed full-time support I, I moved in with with my son and, and husband um so my son at seven could say mesothelioma better than most adults <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and proudly told everybody about mesothelioma uk and, and used to do things like set up little um, lemonade stalls and stuff and and he, he walked uh, he walked a million steps as well i think when he was to raise money eight, to raise money and he's done um triathlons and things to raise money for mesothelia in the uk so that inspirational uh, yeah is going on in the next generation so oh, yeah when, when, when so, did, sorry go on i was just gonna say i think that what we what we did most of is we sat in the garden and we watched we watched the plants grow and we enjoyed the sunshine and we made the quiet moments the most important which is why you know the book is the title of the book is to start the year from its quiet center um my mum said i think this is quite telling my mum said that one of the it made i don't know whether i can say the word crap <laughs> yeah, hey, whatever you like it, this is a safe it made place. crap time better <laughs> was what she said because she said she got to she got to go to the end of her life knowing that she was loved and knowing that maybe she hadn't been such a bad mum after all and i think you know i know i do it maybe most mums do it that they think they haven't quite got it right and they're not yeah. doing it. so she said she had those few months where we were all able to tell her and show her how much she meant to us and how special she was and 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 uh, and that made a lot of difference to her around to us so despite the, you know the, the devastation and the of everything you were going through have you do you look back on those months as being happy months and um satisfying? it's two different experiences mike the physical demands and emotional demands of being a carer at home were huge and and I mean for me as well I was caring for my son and for my father at the same time so I was doing three care jobs it wasn't a lot of sleep yeah <laughs> um and it's really hard to watch you know it was really hard to watch my mum go through what she went through and despite I'm not going to say she was brave because she used to get so annoyed when people said she was brave she said, I'm not brave I'm not brave I'm just you know got to do it haven't i <laughs> yeah you haven't got a lot of choice you've got to do yeah. It. yeah yeah just get on with it so she didn't like being called brave but um it was hard but it was very special it was it was very precious the time that we had um like i said it allowed it allowed me to show her that she was loved and to give back some of the care that she'd given me i think you know that's a privilege to do um it wouldn't i totally recognize that it isn't for everybody you know i think there's part of me that knows that had i known what it would involve i might have not jumped straight in there to, to look after her in the way that i did because it was it was it was quite traumatic as well at times and and it was isolating and i think you know there desperately needs to be more support for carers in yeah in these situations um both during and after because you become a carer and then suddenly you know i i didn't know who to how to talk to anybody if they weren't a nurse <laughs> or a doctor after after that time because i got so used to talking in a certain so language isolated. Yeah. yeah um it's one it area that as a charity that we definitely want to do more research into um because we recognize that um carers you know are just so important so important yeah. um for anybody living with mesothelioma so it's definitely um something we want to look at and it's interesting you say about you know it was a very precious time and i i lost my dad when when uh, very suddenly he died when he was 58 just you know dr drop dead and um i remember and i can still now feel it that i felt very cheated that i didn't have the chance to care for him you know i as a nurse you always expect you know because you spend hours looking after people in hospital you always expect that your own parents are going to need you know weeks or months of care and you're going to be able to lavish them with all the love and tenderness that uh, you do as in your job 
um, with somebody you know that you've loved all your life and and when that didn't happen I felt so cheated that I couldn't spend you know shower him with all that love and care that mm. I'd been got bottled up um so um you know the flip side of that is of course I didn't have to see him go through what you watched your mum go through you know so it's it's what it is we don't we don't get to choose do we you know it just no. is up to us and we do the best we can uh yeah. so all, all through this time then the, the the poems were are you somebody because you're so creative who naturally has creativity going on all the while or were you making notes or how did you create the poems from this experience with your mom well to be honest while I was caring for mum, I didn't have time to to do anything um other than care for my mum. Uh, not you know physically I didn't and emotionally I didn't either there wasn't the space to do it I was just in there and you know that that kind of that end of life care becomes very much minute by minute almost you know the days get yeah. slowed right down um so you get more in <laughs> in a way you know those days felt very very long and then suddenly they were over obviously um but but it was all going in and then after my mum died i knew i needed to i knew i needed support really to 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 cope with that and to to process that loss i don't really like the word process but so I went and I had counselling with the Cruise Bereavement Charity, um, which was really good. And uh, I've lost other members of my family. I lost my sister very suddenly. So I kind of can relate to what you were saying about that, that difference in, you know, when you don't have a chance to say goodbye to somebody. Yeah. Um, so in the process of the cruise uh, counselling, I started to write. Um, so I would sit in, I'd sit in my son's swimming lessons and write. <laughs> and all this stuff, I think all the stuff I'd gone through was just coming, coming out. out. Yeah. Um, and then I sat with it and, and eventually those started coming into being poems and I shared some of them with the cruise bereavement counsellor and then I put them away and got on with life. And, <laughs> and then eventually it was like, well, I think I've got, I think yeah. I've got a little a book of poems and I'd like to, I knew I wanted to write about it. I knew I wanted to share something of that experience, you know, both to honour my mum, but also, you know, my mum always wanted to know what was going to happen and what was happening and what it would be like. And and I think people are a bit frightened of talking about yes. what happens when somebody is at the end part of their life. And, um, you know, there's a curious thing where somebody's dying and living at the same time when you know that, that there's nothing that can be done and that something is changing. My mum always said things like, uh, it was always really hard to to think that her life was going to change and she would think things like, oh my God, I can't possibly have my bed downstairs because I've always slept in a bed upstairs and then, and then she had to have a hospital bed downstairs and then she'd say, oh, you know, it's not so bad actually. Yeah. I can look out the window and... And then she said, once she realised that those things she was frightened of happening weren't so bad, after all, it was just different. Yeah. It became easier. And so she said, as her life got smaller and smaller and smaller in terms of how she could physically live in it, you know, she, she learned to be in that space. And I, I was in that space with her. And I think that, that, that comes through in the poems and I wanted to, I wanted to show something of that I think in what them. what you've just spoke about is the adapting um, and changing that people have to do in order to live with cancer and and when you talk about it as a healthcare professional with a family you can see the immediate fear of of that happening bed downstairs hospital bed you know it's just so alien to your normal life that um but you know it's just a natural step and and if somebody stayed upstairs they're so detached from life in the family that actually coming downstairs is makes you st makes you part of the family more than you know so there's a lot it's just you've just beautifully captured it and uh you know i i i, I as i say i i've heard you um recite um some of the poems and it just resonated with me so much not just as 
a healthcare professional and what I've experienced with people with mesothelioma over the years, but just as a daughter, just as a, a wife, just as a mum, you know, I, I can actually find peace and comfort in your words. And so I'm, I'm so um, looking forward to you reciting. We're just going to have one poem today and you're actually going to share one at the patient care a day. Um, yeah. So just to talk a little bit about the book then. So it's um, launched later this week and it's available on indigodreams.co.uk, which is the website. And there's a beautiful um, uh, bit about you on that website as well that I'd urge people to, uh, to look at. And um, I know that you personally are going to, um, the signed copies that you distribute, you're going to personally make um, some donations from the proceeds of that to the charity. And you've um, also donated a signed copy that our fundraising team are going to auction over the next few weeks, um, which is wonderful. So how many poems are there in the book and um, does it follow a, a pattern in the book or the chapters? Or just tell us about the, the book contents a little bit. So, yeah, Very nice. Um, it's, there, it's, a pam it's what's called a pamphlet. So it's, uh, it's about there's 20 poems and they run in a sequence. Um, and they start with they start with a diagnosis, and they end they end at the midpoint after my mum had had died really. So at the point where I was sort of beginning to I'm not going to say let go, but maybe beginning to step outside of that rawness of of, of the initial <coughs> excuse me the initial grief. Um, and they and they follow really the the, the the experience that we shared of, of her, her illness, um, but also of the days that we had together. So there are some in there that are, you know, very, very physical and, and share more about the, the, the physical realities of, of, of the cancer and, and, and caring. Um, and there are some about, about the fact that my mum had to have a post-mortem and, and having to come to terms with the the medicalization of her body um after so that that's all the way through it really is that that medical language that that becomes part of of life with mesothelioma and even part of afterlife um so that they, they, in the time span i suppose they cover from 2000 the beginning of 2014 um no, the end of oh. <laughs> I get confused about why. No, they, they sort of they, they start really, yeah, from 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 that 2014 point up until about mm, the end of 2016. And I think that's sort of of those two years. Okay. Well, I know you've chosen one that you're gonna share with us. So before we go into that, I just want to say a huge thank you um for putting a window on your experience through your poems. And um, because, you know, I, I, I do all I can to try and give people insight and to, um, to get rid of the fear of a mesothelioma diagnosis. Um, but I can't, I can't prepare people for the sadness, you know, and just loss, losing, doesn't matter how you lose somebody, just losing somebody. Um, having to say your final goodbyes and all the rest of it is sadness that is beyond measure really um but actually just getting a bit of insight into your experience can help put some tools get some tools to, to help with 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 what you're gonna people are gonna face and um so i just you know enormously grateful i will i'm sure be referencing your book for the rest of my <laughs> for the rest of my days and um, I really hope that people can, uh, you know, find some some real comfort and support in your in your words. So thank you very much. I look forward to you sharing another one at the Patient Care a Day. And just to remind people again that it's indigodreams.co.uk, Victoria Bennett. Um, and um, if anybody would like to um just get a bit of support or to talk about any of the issues we've raised today then the uh information line is a uk 0800 169 2409 and with that victoria bennett thank you very much i'm going to hand over to you 
um, to close with um, one of the poems from your book. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um, <clears throat> I also just want to say thank you, really, to, to Misa Thiliemi UK for supporting my family through what we went through and for supporting, allowing me to come along and read the poem from the book and, and share something on my mum's journey. Um, it's very, very special to be able to do that with you because you were very important to us. So, well, thank um, you. Thank you. So this, this poem from the book to start the year from its quiet center this one's called how to watch someone die how to watch someone die first let go of all the plans you once had the casual ways we assume the right to live create a box for all your future tense catch yesterdays in your upturned hands unfurl memories learn to read code before long, these two will be dust. Abandon sleep, forget the clock and roll like a wave on dawns and dusks that drip like morphine into days that feel as if they could go on and on and on. But never look away in case you miss the moment that it ends. Learn to live between the punctuated hours your ears attuned like the city fox to spot an altered breath, your eyes alert to the pallor of skin. Juggle everything and fail, and tell yourself this is your best and know this best will never be enough. Accept you cannot change any of this, and break, and get back up again. Try not to let them die before they die. Try to let them stay in this world, even as this world gets smaller every day. Even if some days you wish an end to this, and when it comes, try to remember to stop, to sit and listen to the silence after the dying is done. Watch the morning come. Try all over again to let go and live. Thank you. Lovely. Lovely. Victoria Bennett, thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, I'd like to just say that if anybody would like me to read these poems anywhere, I'm very happy to do so. Um, um, I'd like to just, I want to share them with people that would like to hear them. So, you know, let me know. <laughs> yeah, lovely. And if anybody wants to contact you, they can do it through the uh, Indigo Dreams site, perhaps, but also Miso UK, Miso UK. We're quite happy to pass on your contact details to anybody who contacts us. Lovely. Okay, thank you. Thank you.